And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, creator of Atlas Rise or Die, the one and only Martin Tsisirk. And I'm sorry for butchering the pronunciation again. No problem. Welcome, everyone. It's an honor to be here again. And um, let's do this. I'm psyched. All right. Now, in, now um, there's been... So, first off, how, how's the development been since the last time I had you on to talk about Atlas? yeah thanks thanks for the question uh it's been pretty intense uh we have come up with a very short let's say extract about the core the very core system mm -hmm. and we have started to develop the word the word of atlas surrounding this uh, this system and with that we put together the layout uh, version of what we hope uh, will be a book pretty soon. That's what we were busy with in the past couple of months, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm I'm happy to say that you already have this uh, sample product, let's say, or extract, mm -hmm. and I'm very curious about your impressions and thoughts about it and uh, i'm happy to to guide you through it and also the listeners uh with some more detailed explanations yeah well let's start let's start with the ba let's start with the basics of the basics um what i did find in what a couple of things that i found interesting is in the is in the the way the pages are laid out mm -hmm. um the for first off with the with the with the use of with the use of um tone when it comes when it comes to the individual pages and the like um this may have been a comparison that ha that you may have heard a bit and it's fr and i wouldn't be surprised if this would if people had brought this up to you beforehand but what in there were two things that instantly came to mind for me um one of one of them was on so, on some level some of the really early um, third edition books, mm -hmm. um, third edition Dungeons and Dragons book. I, I should clarify. The other comparison, the other point of comparison that I ended up that I ended up seeing, and I'm not I'm not saying this directly. It was more of a general vibe kind of thing. Was the um, Conan game that's being produced by um, Aphidius. Um, adventures mm -hmm. in an age undreamed of um, in the sense that it's a in the sense that you have these pages that are busy but not necessarily crowded um, just with just with a lot of just with a fair amount more of activity and a, and a lot more breaks um, was that was when it came to the layout was there an intention to make to make sure that you're not going to have a whole a whole co whole columns with nothing but text, but things that will um, provide a decent amount of breaks in between. Yeah, that was absolutely our plan. Uh, as in terms of uh, of the graphic material we have, and maybe if we dwell into that later, we will see that also as in terms of the word atlas, mm -hmm. and also in terms of the layout. Uh, our aim is to create something vintage, as I said uh, earlier to you too, and this is sort of how we define Atlas Rise or Die, the vintage tabletop uh, sword and sorcery RPG. Mm -hmm. uh, so we definitely aimed for something that kind of resurrects that era and mood. Um, and also, uh, more specifically, we we had to create we wanted to and still want to create something that is well like nice for the eye it's not overburdened and 
you know, since it's it's this this book we hope will be about adventures and and fun. It cannot be, you know, like I don't know the 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 civil code of Minnesota. It cannot be dry. It cannot be. Uh, we it also we don't want it to be justified. The lines we want a nice amount of information, pictures, but also also designed in a way that if you're looking for something very specific, you know, in the heat of the combat, you would be able to to find it quickly. Mm-hmm. Now, in that now going on that going. All right, I think I think we had a bit. I think we had a one second hiccup, but seem, I think we're good right now. Um, the next thing that I wanted to ask is on the is on the core engine, because I think, and I will I will admit I, I will admit to taking a bit of a bit of my a bit of the um, L on the on this to a, to a degree with my initial impressions, because when a lot of people talk about talk about doing a vintage style game. One of the things that ends up coming about is using old school mechanics, especially using, say, AD and D mechanics or 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 a different game from, say, the eighties. But that, but for one, that I don't really, I don't really see you guys doing that. And two, instead of using a straight D twenty, you're using um, two ten siders. Um, yes. Now, when it came to the choice about using two ten siders, what I was curious about was, did you go with that approach because you preferred the bell curve that two d tens have, or um, were or were there some other reasons that you went with that as opposed to other die um, systems? All right. Uh, as in terms of uh, whether uh, old school game mechanics brings uh, a sort of vintage feeling to that. Uh, to be quite frank, we didn't even think about to to experiment with that. Mm-hmm. We were, uh, in terms of vintageness, we were focusing on the rawness and brutality of it. Uh, in the core system, we wanted to achieve something that is uh, easy to handle, so we ruled out the D hundred system that is also used by some RPGs, because with that you would need to divide, multiply, add and subtract with three digit numbers all the time, and that significantly slows down the game without providing any specific added value. So we wanted to use smaller values as you know, base numbers for different calculations which brought us to a either d20 or a uh, two uh, ten-sided die system mm-hmm. uh, d20 is of course very well known uh, i don't want to say the name but of course uh, dnd brought it like quite mainstream we did not rule out it because of that but because we very much prefer the two than two d10 dice system and the main reason for that is is what you mentioned is the curvature of the distribution of events. So the most common throw with a two ten D will be eleven, mm-hmm. which is an average value, uh, and this more closely resembles how events naturally are distributed or how the likeliness of events are distributed in nature. In nature the more average a a less extreme an event is that is more likely to happen so uh, in atlas rise or die it will be also mirrored in a way that uh, extremes will be less common which also which means two things uh, for example in, in a combat or in um, or in the uh, detection system in atlas when where where you have to gather information more will depend on how the player plays out uh, his or her character or the situation as opposed because the the throws will be more often average values uh, so it's more it, more calculated in a way that uh, extraordinary events are uh, more rare so it puts uh, 
uh, more massive burden on the player to play it out nice and uh, not to expect on a natural 20 or to prevent him or her uh, from from screwing, uh, screwing everything up with a natural one despite he or she playing the situation quite nice. So that was one aim to to make it a more narrative system and and mitigate the element of randomness. And uh, the second one was was close to that, uh, but uh, but not not quite. It also means that um, if you um, like split split atlas into two parts, mm -hmm. the core system and the word, uh, because the values are quite similar to other systems, it will be, let's say, interchangeable. So if you want to use the system of Atlas in um, in Forgotten Realms, etc., it's also doable. Or if you want to play with a system that, that you are more familiar with and more uh, um, comfortable with, you can do that too uh, with the characters. Uh, of Atlas Rise or Die in the world of Atlas Rise or Die. So interchangeability and more uh, player and and more um, narrative focused game were the two factors that we went with uh, with the two D ten system. Yeah. Now, and I th and the other thing that I noticed out, out of that was. And it was a yeah, emphasis on degrees of success, as opposed as opposed to just doing a straight on off um, success or failure. Now, I've seen degrees of success used pl used plenty of t use. Oh. All right then. Yeah, are we back? Yeah. So sorry about that. There, there. No worries. There was one. There was one of those moments. Um. When it comes now, when it comes to degrees of success, some something that I do find in that I do find um, interesting with this is because is the is the range the ranges that you have and the fact that you have three degrees of success and three degrees of failure. A lot of times when I've seen degrees of success, um, it's never gone in. It's rarely gone into detail about the about the um, margin for e margin for each and i i do ap i do apologize in advance for for using margin of success and degrees of success interchangeably it's a case of old habits no um, worries but a lot of t a lot of times the degrees of success is under underused or or um ha or hand waved away as, as um gm fiat now what i'm curious about is this system of margin of success is that something that's going to be reflected in the and the other in the other mechanics like when it comes to say ma when it comes to say magic and we'll probably dive deep deeper into that in the f in the future but is it go is it going to be a case where um you'll have well you where you might have tables that show specific results about whether or not something is a critical grave ordinary failure or ordinary massive or masterful success absolutely uh that's that's what we plan the the margins of successes margins of success will be uh used in all the the subsystems of atlas mm -hmm. whether it's uh, whether they are attributes whether it's the use of skill, whether it's gathering information, whether it's influencing NPCs, uh, and if if we consider that in Atlas a uh, an act of casting a spell is a role for uh, for the for for the character's magic skill, uh, it's it's quite uh, uh, natural that. Uh, critical grave ordinary failures and uh, ordinary and massive and masterful successes will come in and play a factor. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the concept of Atlas's six subsystems, with, with, the, way, with the way it's um, presented here, 
I'm cur I'm curious if if this if it was done if it was done in this way for beyond just organization, which uh, which is a self-explanatory affair. Was it also done th this way so so that a G so that a GM could could um make clear could make clear during session zero what systems are more likely to be used um during the, during this campaign and what won't be. Like if he's if he's running mm -hmm. a system with a bunch, with a not to put too fine a point in it band of bastards he's probably going he's probably going he probably put in a note saying we're not going to be using the magic system for this or we're not or um if he's running political intrigue he'd make a note that we're going to be using the influence system a lot so build accordingly. Mm, we did, for for the second part of your question the answer is. No, we have not thought about that. That the uh, GM or DM or or, or LM, uh, however you want to call him or her, will announce it. Uh, this is something we don't really want to meddle, and we don't even want to give guidelines for that because I think this uh, type of decision is very much or so much party dependent. That, that this is something that a, a RPG creator cannot even give guidelines like how how a DM prepares his or her group for a uh, campaign or a session. The main reason behind creating these subsystems that function very much based on the same rules is that we want, because it's a brand new RPG, uh, we plan to come on Kickstarter pretty soon. Uh, I hope we can talk about that too. Mm -hmm. So it's a brand new system. Uh, and let's be honest, nowadays not many people are too keen to study hundreds of pages of um, pure rules. So we wanted to make it as simple as possible, as easy to learn as possible. And since they are, especially the influence and the detection system, quite two subsystems that are, at least in this form, are quite new. They were created in a very streamlined and, and very uh, similar way to each other. So those two subsystems can be learned, I think, in a pretty, pretty fast way. Attributes and skills, of course, are used by other RPGs, so we didn't have to simplify them uh, as much because they are quite well known. And combat and magic, of course, is a, in a sword and sorcery system is uh, almost the heart and soul of of a uh, of a RPG. So we want to to elaborate those, but since they are the most unique features of a of a rpg system in general uh, we want to spend more time on that because they are not fully developed at this stage but the attribute skill uh, uh, influence system which is about influencing mpcs and the detection system which is about gathering information are almost fully up and running mm -hmm. And speaking of the attribute system, what I did find interesting in the in this was the relationship with primary and secondary attributes and and how those are created. Um, in per in particular, the whole con the whole concept of the secondary attributes br branching off in two ways from a primary, which. In a roundabout way, reminded me of Legend of the Five Rings in ge in general in general and the um, roll and keep system as a whole, since it has a similar relationship with the rings and um, attributes. Now, when it, when it came to set when it came to setting up that particular relationship, was the em was the emphasis to make sure that um. That pe that you had variety within builds. Um, a bit yes, variety always always makes makes things more spicy and interesting. Oh, but what we had in mind uh, 
more was that to to differentiate between more complex throws, trials, savers, however you call them, and more specific ones. Uh, so primary attributes, which are stem. more complex task is mm -hmm. about to be accomplished mm -hmm. and secondary attributes uh, are used when when something quite specific comes to comes to mind so let's say uh, to, to, to give give you and the listeners some examples so we have agility as a primary attribute uh, and it has two corresponding secondary attributes, uh, dexterity and swiftness. So dexterity is, is more like a movement coordination uh, when it comes to lock picking, jug, uh, juggling, wire walking, that kind of fancy stuff. And swiftness is the other element of agility, which is like the raw speed of how, how fast you can run. So those are quite uh, obvious and and in a way their summary is the agility which is also your raw speed and your dexterity as in as as your movement coordination mm -hmm. so both skills are needed in a very short time let's say run run as fast as hell and then jump into a window and uh, do these fancy Chuck Norris movements, then it's agility what will be tried. But when it comes to uh, more more specific things, let's say lock picking, then it is your dexterity that is that is uh, that you have to roll for. Uh, and also, uh, so so we wanted to create this to to model the different levels of complexity of of trials that characters and, and players face throughout their adventures. Uh, and what I would like to add is that the, the secondary attributes are more commonly used or will be more commonly used once Atlas is published because they give you the, the base stats for different skills, different um, um, abilities and attributes, etc. And what I would like to add at this point is uh, when we created this system that a prim primary attribute corresponds to two uh, secondary attribute, we wanted to make sure that characters are, are balanced, varied, but balanced in a way that, let's say, an Amazon who, who depends on her uh, skills of uh, shooting and, and throwing lances and spears will also be more real in a way that if, if she can do that, it also means that her other uh, physical attributes are quite advanced. So vari variety and, and uh, reality within the game were both points of view when we, when we came up with that. Mm -hmm. Construction. Yeah. Now, the other the other thing when it comes to the whole when it comes to the whole um, concept of of at of um of of the attribute and skill setup that we ha that we have with this particular type of game type of um game is the is the f is the nat that I was curious about is the nature of primary, secondary, and, ter and tertiary skills. That's very good because mm. that's one of my favorite parts within <laughs> Atlas Rise or Die. Because so, now, yes. Now before I, now bef before you dive into that, I do I do want to make note I do want to make note of something because this does this does kind of um, touch touch on a bit of a problem that ends up happening. With games with um skill systems, um Shadowrun being one of the Shadowrun and um sometimes Warhammer Fantasy roleplay mm -hmm. being high on the worst offenders of this kind of thing, where there are 
way, way too many skills, only a certain number of points, and you end up result you end up having what I've come to call choice paralysis in terms of what you can put what you can put in and what's going to be important or not important. Uh, all right, let's. Uh, I, I, I will start with this in a, in a general way, and then we can we can talk about how we we are try to avoid this uh, decision paralysis or what was it? Choice paralysis. Choice paralysis. Yes. Okay. So, what happens in the skill system? Uh, okay. So skills, as opposed to attributes, are not innate. Um, representations of, of the character, let's say strength or stamina, because everyone has strength or stamina. Uh, it can be uh, a, a low value, but everyone has that by default. Skills are um, learned and, and acquired knowledge. And they are categorized in two ways. First, uh, they are categorized uh, in an objective way. So each skill can be put into uh, five categories, combat skills, mundane skills, underground skills, survival skills, and academic skills. Mm -hmm. And there is a subjective categorization in terms of different classes, prioritizes different types of skills in a different way because that's what classes are for. They, they give you a certain path. So, for example, for fighters, obviously, combat skills are much more important than academic skills. Meanwhile, for a bard, mundane skills are much more important than survival skills. Mm -hmm. That's, I think, uh, nothing new. What, what we did differently is that we that we try to make it quite emphasized that if you if you pick a class and in terms of n n the narrative it means that you had a formal education either in an institution or, or by a uh, a patron of some sort or you or you had a uh, noble background which also put you on a path so that means that the affinity of of the uh, characters for different types of skills are different and that uh, translated to the to the language of the game means the different categories of skills uh, cost more uh, for different class or cost less for different classes depending on who they are i give you a example and i give the listeners an example and it will be more uh, understandable. Mm -hmm. So let's say uh, we have sorceresses in uh, in Atlas Rise or Die. Uh, this this class, which is is a bit more of a uh, sorcerer in D and D, because these are these let's say witches in a way so like beautiful mm -hmm. women seductive and and relying on manipulation and uh, and dark magic so for for them for sorceresses the two primary skills uh, are academic and underground and this means that learning academic and underground skills for a sorceress will cost less than uh, other type of skills uh, the second, the second, so these are called primary skills, which are like the cheapest, quote to quote, to learn for a sorceress. Uh, the secondary skill type for them uh, is mundane. Uh, I think that's also explainable in from a from a narrative point of view because they are these high society figures. Mm -hmm. One secondary skill, uh, so which are cheaper than tertiary skills but more expensive to learn than primary skills uh, is available so like not set by default so the character can pick whether it will be uh, monday uh, sorry survival or or, uh, or combat skills uh, and the tertiary one tertiary uh, category is what that is left with. So in that case, let's say 
um, the, the player wants to create a, a sorceress then also can effectively backstab her quote-to-quote lovers, uh, he or she can pick uh, combat skills as secondary, or the other option is to pick survival skills as secondary and, and combat skills and tertiary. So what we what we had here in the mind is to light a path or or, or set a path that is, that is quite strict because of your back because of the character's background, because of 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 the way education uh, works in the world of Atlas, but we also wanted to create some room for variety and and more customization for a for a Atlas player. Mm-hmm. Now, when it com- now since you since you mentioned um, classes a bit, I do want to I do want to dive into to that a bit with with the way classes are pre- are um, presented. Would it list what's what um, skill categories are considered um, primary, se- secondary, and tertiary, respectively? Uh, we will we will create that. We haven't got to the point uh, where we more elaborately detail uh, classes, different mm-hmm. classes, but we have some um, in the mind, uh, which is similarly similar to what we did with races so we have we will have some classic features classic um archetypes of of fantasy settings if you allow me let's say fighter bard sorceress warlock etc but we want to twist it a little bit to make it more uh, more raw more barbarian but but we're not there yet mm-hmm. but yes for what we will most certainly do is to decide what skills will be primary for a class, what is the one skill uh, category that is secondary to a class, and the remaining two are free to be changed between secondary and tertiary by the player, or or decided at the at the creation of the character. Now, to. Now, to that end, I'd like to um, I'd like to shift a bit into the influence system. Now, yes, the idea of a the idea of a social system, which for for all for is not too far removed from what from what um, this sort of system is. This is one of those things that a lot of I've seen a lot of games attempt attempt to do, but it's rife with um, traps. More tra- more traps than a more traps than a dungeon, or more traps than the overrated mm. Tomb of Horrors. <laughs> um, and one of the, one of the main ones is is ha- is having RNG in um in in interaction. Now what I'm cu- now what I'm curious about with with this is to is how is how how you're going about making it so that. Even even when there is um, RNG in these in, in these methods of inter- in these methods of interaction, that it do- that a player doesn't feel like the their ability to play the character is hampered, because there's al- there's always been a debate about whether or not this kind of thing should just be um, in the role playing part of it and not in a dice rolling. Yes. Very good, very good question. What we had in mind uh, as the very basic thought behind the influence system is that not many players feel hindered by these, let's say, throws when it comes to that, but more players feel feel like they they are suppressed because, let's say, someone plays a charismatic bard Mm-hmm. Uh, who convinces everyone about everything and seduces uh, every hot woman? The player is not this bard. This this player does not have the charisma and does not have the eloquence to do so. So so what happens? Nothing. Or 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 the DMs can say like, okay, like I'm sorry, man, you're a, you're a crappy bard. Play your uh, character better. So this is what. Uh, 
random pass. Mm -hmm. So we have influence methods, which which are tools to to convince NPCs to do as the player pleases. It has diplomacy, it has eloquence, it has seduction, it has intimidation, all the good old tools. What happens in the Atlas system is that the player uh, first chooses the influence method, chooses the aim, and can briefly and vaguely describe what he will say, what kind of arguments will he present, what kind of uh, um, negative at attribute or, or negative feature of the NPC will he use, let's say, uh, greed in case of bribery or or, uh, or being a shy person in case of intimidation, and vaguely describes what, what he will say. If we have a more uh, um, practiced player, he can even say exactly what his or her character will say. So all these elements will be factored in, and the DM can decide, okay, basically basically this player described completely uh, what what is happening in the in the situation. So I give him or her, or her a uh, plus five modifier just because he he played it really nice. Or the DM can say, okay, the, 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 the player listed the arguments uh, for, for diplomacy or, or the, the, the player listed vaguely what kind of lies he, will, he or she will use if case, in case of demagogy. So that's enough. I will roll uh, for this social situation without the, the, the modifier, which are given based on nice role play. So in this way, I think we made a, not to boast, of course, but, but a quite nice compromise between leaving the role-playing element in so, social situations within the game, which is quite important and quite fun, but also enable players uh, who are not, not so eloquent or not so shy at the table, not so brave at the table or more reserved at the table, to play with a character that that is not them, and let's be honest, that's one of the most fun part of a role-playing game, playing someone who you who you are obviously not. Yeah. Now, within the within that within that um that kind of a that kind of approach, um, something that something that I noticed. Is the fact that there that um there's diff that there are th at least three at least three skills for each um each method, and I'm curious if that if the reason that was done was to was to have it that there are certain uh, pr there are certain um monkey wrenches that can get thrown in regarding ha regarding inf regarding influ influence that you have planned. So some so somebody who say is using command um, is going to is going to have certain advantages and disadvantages that someone who compared to someone who might be using um, straight seduction. Sorry, can you repeat the first part of the question? The the connection was quite bad. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Um, when it comes to the when it comes to the matter of um, influence, the thing the thing that I most note that I most note is the is the um the, is when it comes to the different methods you have different skills about that. Um, taking into account the whole skill group um, skill category thing that we mentioned earlier, was th was this multiple skill approach thing done so that you didn't have a, you didn't have a single class having a monopoly on the influence system? Because that's something I could easily see, say, a bard having a, a bit more of a pull on. Uh, yeah, that was one of one of the the underlying concept behind it. Because every every character can and must interact in social situation uh, from a narrative perspective. So in Atlas Rise or Die, even the not so charismatic, not so charming non-bards must, let's say, do their shopping. 
So obviously every every NPC has to function uh, in in a in a social context. And when it comes to players, also every every type of or almost every type of character should should have a say on on what's what is happening in social situation. And yes, we didn't want to to create this uh, let's say division of labor between classes when you have let's say a super optimized party when all the barbarian does the hacking and slashing or the the bard gathers all the information and gets the party into higher circles the priest does the healing i i i I think you get what i'm talking about Mm -hmm. we we wanted to create a more quote to quote realistic party where of course the classes have their strong sides and weak sides and uh, their advantages and disadvantages obviously just as the the playable races but we we wanted to avoid that in in a social situation the fighter quietly sits in the back yeah now Smith, i think i think it com- i think it comes down to the difference between between having a playstyle with a class and a class having a playstyle, um, the la- the latter is, in my opinion, something to, something to avoid to avoid to avoid. And the other th- the other the next one they wanted they want to go into is the detection system, um, which I could see some I could see some people looking at that looking at that as um. A means of a means of being a stealth system, but I get the feeling that stealth in that particular sense is only one facet of what the detection system is intended to do. You're absolutely right. In in Atlas Razor Die Detection System describes everything that is about gathering information from NPCs mm-hmm. or 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 without NPCs. So it it uh, encompasses um, gathering information about a person, gathering information about a place, about a historic event, etc. And it can happen in various ways. It can happen what the, what you have just described as stealth, like eavesdropping, um, etc. But it can happen in uh, in social situations. Mm-hmm. Uh, as in terms of sensing someone, someone's motives, like, or 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 senses some if someone is lying, or we have the uh, good old-fashioned um, torture, which we named interrogation, uh, which is of course self-explanatory. So all these things in Atlas Rise or Die come to under one umbrella, which is the detection system, um, and it functions. When it comes to tracking, when it comes to asking around, when it comes to eavesdropping, uh, work based on the same uh, game mechanics, but of course, from a narrative perspective, they are very different. Mm-hmm. Now, the other thing, the uh, when it comes now, when it comes to the, when it comes to that, there there definitely seems to be an. Imp- an implication that um that mechanically speaking the um detect detection and influence are I'm not going to say I'm not going to say closely alike but but akin to sister systems. Yeah, they are quite analogous and that's what I was talking about in the beginning mm-hmm. that these two subsystems in this way at least we we find them pretty pretty novel. So for this reason, we wanted to create them very analogous. So, you know, once you learn one, you are quite familiar with the other ones. So you can get to the action. Now, next we get into the nit... I want to get into the nitty gritty of combat. Now, you've mentioned you mentioned wanting to do a... A um, a very vi- a very vintage. Oh, All right. Sorry, sorry about that. Next, 
Um, I want I want to delve into uh, combat, which uh, which is going to be one of those things that a lot of people are going to are going to have a few highlights about, given the sword and sorcery background of Atlas. And some something that I do something that I do. Sorry, the connection is. Nope, no worries, man. We'll po we'll power through it. It's what we do. It's what we do best here in the temple. Um, hang, hang on a, hang on a second. Sorry about sorry about the technical difficulties, folks. It is what it is. And... <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I think we yeah. I think we ended up hit. I think we ended up hitting call at the same time. <laughs> yeah, when great minds connect, huh? <laughs> so, what I was getting into before the shenanigans was um. Something I find interesting when it comes to the when it comes to the uh, combat system is ha is having um is that is having four pillars with it when it comes to the combat factors attack deflect aim and dodge now a lot now a lot of times when th when this sort of thing when this sort of thing is done you've you end up having two camps. You either have the D and D style camp of a universal attack and ar an armor approach, or you end up having the more skill the more skill centric um, approach. But what I'm seeing out of th what I'm seeing out of this is the is um t is for one for one I appreciate the separation between at between um. Attack, attacking value and damage value, so there, pro so there probably won't be the case of someone's damage being um, a little too static. But there's also there's also the fact that because because of the fact that some, something like deflect and dodge might be just turned into armor class in a, in a certain other game. You have you have a setup where it's just as where it can be just as viable to have light have light or no armor as opposed to having everybody be tanky. Um, was that one of the design goals with the with the uh, combat factors to make it so that um, in the, uh, on paper at least um, lightly armored characters are not at too much of a detriment. Sort of, but in in a more more general and more abstract way. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, we we wanted to differentiate differentiate between attack value and damage value. So yes, the damage is not static. I think, you know, that's quite mm -hmm. industry standard nowadays. Also online, um, when it comes to armor class, we we have not even touched that. Uh, because we we are still debating, but we wanted to to differentiate between whether someone is hit and whether someone is damaged, also in terms of armor. So 
with with light armor obviously you can you can uh, let's say absorb some damage while staying agile uh, so your your aim or your attack or your or your deflect or your dead dodge value remain sort of intact mm -hmm. but also uh, absorb some moderate amount of damage or with heavy armor classes or with heavy armor characters you your your combat factors will significantly decrease because you're not as agile you're not as uh, swift you are not as punctual with aiming in a heavy armor but you will be able to absorb more damage which is basically what happened in 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 reality in medieval times you could you could never hit you could never even damage a uh, a uh, plate armor knight with with conventional methods uh, but but it's still very much um I'm biased towards towards heavy armor uh, using classes, and this is something we we have to have to deal with because uh, maybe not in the maybe not in the system, but we will make let's say full plate armors extremely expensive, so you you can only only use them at uh, at later levels when when you're also when the when the characters. Uh, property and 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 their estates, let's say, quote unquote, uh, bring some income. So, yes, we wanted to wanted to balance this this problem that has been existing for a while. And the one other thing is that we had as an underlying concept is that basically a row. Or, or more or the most simple combat system is attack did you did you hit yes calculate damage the other person attacks did you hit yes if yes calculate damage if no etc etc so and this is quite boring especially for those people who have been playing ttrpgs uh, especially sword and sorcery TTRPGs for a while, so obviously we wanted to spice it up a bit. And what we had in mind is also, it does also correspond to 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 the other subsystems of Atlas with with the margins of success and failures and successes. So also as in life, also as in combat, you from time to time you have to take take a risk to advance somewhere which which can be high risk high reward low risk low reward etc but you have to have to take a risk to to get out of this steel stand and these are what we call combat tricks and combat maneuvers so a character can try to let's say um I'm I'm sorry I'm looking at my cheat sheet. <laughs> um, let's say getting on your feet uh, combat trick, which can be used to to get behind the enemy if you are successful, and then you can uh, backstab him. But if it's unsuccessful, you you can just as easily jump into the sword of the enemy. So by further developing at the later point these combat maneuvers and and uh, elaborating quite a few of them as we plan now our aim is to to forget about the the, the boring fights where you okay come on pff, uh goddamn i don't know highwayman again and we have to just okay quickly kill them because also NPCs have mind and NPCs can use these combat tricks. So even, even higher level battles will be quick. So you don't have to, let's say, subtract damages like 20 times within a, within a fight. And it's also more realistic that you, even if you're a strong orc barbarian, if you're stabbed in, in your kidney, you, you will die quite soon. So 
with that, we want to facilitate a combat system that first, every encounter is quite unique and memorable. Uh, second, you have to use your brain and you have to measure risks and rewards and choose wisely. And third, they are not long and, and again, boring, just calculating damages. Mm-hmm. Now, a couple things within within the uh, combat system description that I wanted to go into. The first is the concept of success bonuses, which, given the uh, margins of success that we that that has been that we've talked about pre- previously, when it comes to this, is it a, is it a case where a, a higher margin of success grant grants the opportunity for more bonus options or Oh. Oh. Yes. When it comes to success bonuses. Yes. What is it? A, is it a case where a um, higher margin of success grants more pit grants more potential proverbial picks, or is it a case where the ind- where individual um, bonuses would have stronger effects? The first one. Definitely the first one. Mm-hmm. So one one um, well placed and well thought out use of of uh, of bonuses can have the uh, most significant effect in a combat. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes now, um, when it comes to when it comes to maneuvers. Which I'm get, which I'm guessing are going, are, I'm guessing, are going to be the um, back, the backbone for a lot of martial centric characters. Like you're, you're not. I don't foresee um, that many characters who who are ba- who are um, based in how how they use their particular we- particular weapons or fighting styles or what have you. Having ju- having just the st- just the standard types of attacks, so there's they're probably going to have a handful of maneuvers and learn and learn more as they develop. Absolutely the case, and and by by giving more options for combat maneuvers for fighting classes, this is also one way to avoid that uh, let's say melee or or non spellcaster characters the scale at higher levels so we want to keep them competitive and also if if you think about the the variety of 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 spells which spellcasters can have as opposed to melee classes who have uh, let's say attack defense and calculating damage it seems very unfair, and it makes melee classes a lot more boring. So we wanted to, yeah, I wanted to say something political, but uh, yeah, make the melee classes great again. Sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't withhold it. Um, if it hel- if it if it helps any, one, we meme everything here in the temple, and two. The guys at against the dark master ha- have it. Ha- have a have put out a particular image called "Make Criticals Hurt Again." So oh, okay. You're, I so didn't, you're in didn't good, know. so you're in good company. And s- <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. That's reassuring. And yeah, that does touch on a bit on a bit of a pet peeve, and probably the main reason why I will never be a full OSR type of type of individual. Um, because. I've mentioned this in the past, but a long time ago, I did a little experiment mm-hmm. where I went through several fantasy games that I had, and I calculated the ratio of pages total in the and I want to make clear in the core books only because using expansion books for some games um, would skew things. And how I many think... pages were just dedicated to? Spe- to um, spell rules, i.e., the rules for s- individual spell effects. Um, in the in that when it came to the uh, st- when it came to the sample size that I had, the biggest offender of of ha- of having the of having the most spells to page ratio 
was a two-way tie between D&D 3rd Edition and Pathfinder. Mm. And the thing is, when you put when you um when you have that many that much emphasis put on the spellcasters, it leaves less room in the book to focus on other matters. Which is probably the reason why prestige classes weren't in the player's handbook. Actually, it more or less is the reason they ran out of room. And I'd argue if you just if you just dialed back on the spells a little bit, you wouldn't have that problem. <laughs> true that. True that. Um, especially, especially when so many spells were just the same spell, but with one little change, like how many, prof- how many protection from spells does, a, does a book, re- does a book really need? Do you really need I, to I, have, I feel pro- you. do you really need to have protection from good protection from evil protection from law protection from chaos all be their own separate entries? Let, let's leave it an open-ended <laughs> question. <laughs> Well, that that one was a bit that one was a bit rhetorical, but you but you get my but I think you get my I, point. I absolutely get your point. Yes, yes, yes. And um, speaking of speaking of which, let's talk let's talk about the magic system because this is one of those things where I could where I could see some some potential issues. Now, to put things in contrast about this, um, I played I played a fair bit of. Middle Earth role playing over the years, and the magic system yes. in that one is contentious. Mostly, be- mostly because of the fact that it's a fine magic system on its own, even if it can get a little OP. But have, but it doesn't quite fit the way that magic is supposed to work in a setting l- like Lord of the Rings, you know, where everything is more subtle. Now. A lot of times with sword and sorcery um, set, um, setups, magic Sorry, is... I, I couldn't hear you there. Oh, like, a lot of times with sword and sorcery setups, magic is seen as extremely dangerous, riddled with superstition, or, so, or something that's treated, act, that's treated with um, active disdain. And what I'm, what I'm curious about with, with this is... Given that Atlas is going to be a sword and sorcery style of play, how do you how how did you guys reflect that within the magic system to make sure that it doesn't get too high powered? Yes, sorry, the the connection was no. bad. No wor- no worries, it happens. So uh, you you told me that. In most systems, like magic is uh, frowned upon, or or in, mo- uh, in most, at um, in mo- I want to clarify in most in most sword and sorcery um, settings, magic is um, either either frown- either frowned upon, hev- heavily um, rooted in superstition, or um, treated with disdain, or s- sometimes more sometimes more than one of those. And I'm cur- and what I was curious about is mechanically. How how um how does the magic system here fit into that fit into that kind of um sword and sorcery approach? Okay, good that you that you mentioned this traditional approach narratively to mm-hmm. to magic. Um, this is not what what will happen in Atlas. I don't say that magic is is mainstream, and and every villager can cook their meal with a fireball, but it will be more mainstream, more known and less feared as in other system. So no no superstition, no disdain, rather rather envy and um, and uh, admiration is the mainstream reaction one gets uh, in Atlas as a spellcaster character. So that is something we don't have to translate mechanically, generally. Of course there there can be regions or can be can be people who who oppose magic. And that is always uh, up to the, the, the specific GM uh, to decide how it is handled. But 
but in Atlas spellca spellcasters don't have to have to hide in general. But of course, uh, there are more dubious or more obscure kind of magic like necromancy. Uh, with that, one has to be more careful. But we thought that this is something that you can't and shouldn't translate into into mechanical rules. This is something really narrative based, narratively rooted in the game, and and that should be the task of the, the GM to depict this disdain towards necromancy or this fear in a um, in a way that is uh, playable and and understandable and enjoyable for the players. All right, now. I've, now, of course, I do appreciate magic being used as a as a skill ch as a skill check, meaning that um, spell casting is not a guarantee, also known yes. as the fire and forget rule. Um, the other the other thing that uh, the other thing that I find um, interesting is the use of magical stamina points. Um, now. When it comes now, sometimes I've seen instances where where the whole concept of casting spells tires you is that your your um phys, that your phys, that once that um particular reserve reaches zero, your physical condition takes some temporary hits. Um, is there a similar approach with this where um? Where having magical stamina reach zero, aside from the fact that you can't cast magic, has other consequences? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, physical consequences within the spellcaster's body or mind. And depending on the overuse of magical stamina points, or, or depending on the level of failure of the, of the skill check, they can be long-lasting or or even even permanent mm -hmm. so careful with magic kids yeah now when it comes now when it comes to when it comes to leveling up spells um what i do find it given given oh yes so, um when it comes to the concept of leveling up spells would it be fair of me to say that the spell list is not is not a is not a case of, um, like how it how it is in certain games where you have this these spells are of one tier these spells are of a higher tier these spells are of a higher tier and so on. Would it be accurate instead for me, for me to say that the that the uh, spell that um spells are or, are not organized in se in separate levels but rather. In broad groups, and they and they can be leveled up as the as the uh, play, as the player wishes instead. Absolutely, the case. We have different categories of of spells, as in terms of their uh, aim and their um, the, the the way they are used, mm -hmm. uh, whether whether they are like evil or less evil, but they are not categorized in terms of their strength and they are not automatically gained when leveling up. Uh, yes, yeah, so they are not, not uh, automatically gained and not uh, automatically strengthened when leveling up. Uh, it, it will be also about a clever allocation of resources and a character has to hang on a sec, we'll get him back we'll get him back shortly.
Hey. Hello. <laughs> uh, w- w- where was I? Um, you were uh, you were on the ca- strength on the, amplifying yep. strength strength leveling up spells, mm-hmm. right? Yes. And the ne- the next thing that was that I was going to that I was going to ask is in regard to the uh, school the schools of magic. Now, there's always been di- there's always been different styles, and what I was curious with this now, given how given how spellcasting is effectively effectively a skill check, um, and the and the whole category thing that we mentioned with classes, is there is there a se- is there a setup within classes where it um dic- where it dictates um, the the whether or not certain schools of magic are would be counted as primary, secondary, or tertiary skills. Um, not a bad idea, I have to say. You you could uh, you could join us as a developer. We haven't thought about it, but that would make a lot of sense to to categorize schools of magic as in as in terms of primary, secondary, tertiary. Mm-hmm. Uh, for different spellcasting classes, as skills for 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 all of the classes, uh, keeping in mind what what I have previously mentioned at at where we were talking about the skills is that there is a predetermined route, uh, a path that a spellcaster has to take based on his or her formal education. Mm-hmm. But let's leave also a pretty decent room to maneuver for the player to make make it more unique or spicy. Yep. Now something 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 else that I noticed in the exa- in the example spells is it talk it talks about um, spellcaster level. And this this brings me to something that I've been something that I've been curious about. A lo- when it come, whenever it comes to advancement, there tends to be t- there tends to be um, two major schools of thought. The first one is um, is obviously level based. The second one is do is experience as a currency, i.e., it costs this much XP to level something up and so on. Given what what's mentioned about spellcaster level and what's mentioned about skills. Is it a case where every time you level up, you get a certain number of points to spend on um, on skills or backgrounds or what have you? Yes. After after heated debates, we picked the uh, leveling up model as opposed to the uh, experience point as a resource model um, because we we thought that leveling up the character is such a feeling such a milieu that that is um, irreplaceable Mm -hmm. Uh, so that and that also goes with our uh, concept that Hang, hang on, hang on. We're um, we're working through this. Yes, hi. <laughs> so where was I? Sorry, um, that's that. that. It was. It was. You had mentioned after. You had mentioned heated debate regarding regarding leveling. Yes. So we decided to go with the leveling up model as opposed to allocating experience as a resource model mm-hmm. because we 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 thought we deemed that 
leveling up is such a, a irreplaceable feeling uh, of our cherished childhood that that it should not be sacrificed on the altar of uh, of narrative consistency, and that also goes better with our with our vintage concept because leveling up is 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 the vintage or one of the vintage traits. But at the same time, we wanted to avoid that uh, certain backgrounds are reached automatically or certain skills are gathered automatically when leveling up or certain spells are learned automatically when leveling up. So it, whenever a character learns a new skill, etc., we strongly encourage parties to, to make it uh, into a consistent narrative. And what also happens at leveling up is certain... Uh, amount of character advancement points are free to be allocated so it's also a resource management type of thing which is more getting more mainstream nowadays i think mm -hmm. i feel this is something that vampire the masquerade uses which is which is a system i i have to say i'm quite fond of so again we try to reach a compromise in which we still can experience the pure joy of leveling up, but at the same time, this leveling up will remain narratively consistent and reams, leaves a healthy room to maneuver. I can I can get behind that. Um, when it comes to the when it comes to the example spells, one of the one of the things that I no that I noticed was the concept of magic level and i had a couple questions on how on how that plays out um the first of the first of these is 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 um is magic level like the min like the minimum amount of ranks that you'd need to have in um spell in a spell casting skill in order to use that spell or it or um is it a is it determining how determining the difficulty of the uh, of trying to cast the spell yes but the second one absolutely the second one so there will be a target number for the spell casting skill check in in which you roll with two d10 dice um add up the modifiers and if you have a success you can or you were able to cast that spell successfully. Also, there are also there are uh, chances to to do a critical success, but you can you can do a massive failure. So, while there is technically no required level to cast this or that spell, uh, you are strongly encouraged to to calculate. Whether whether you really want to to try to to cast that certain, let's say, um, dim summoning spells spell for 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 which you might be a little too unexperienced. Oh, all right, um, and of and of course with the um, rusting spell, I see that it can, that based on based on how it's set up, it's if you're casting yes. it from. Would it be f based on how the rusting spell in the um, extract is described? Would it be fair to say that if you're ca if you're casting it from the battle school, it's only level one, but if you're casting from the alchemy school, it's level two? Sorry, I couldn't hear you. Um, with the rusting spells, is it fair of me to say that if you're casting it from battle, it counts as a level one spell? But if you're casting from alchemy, it counts as a level two. Uh, yeah. So what we had in mind here is that, uh, yeah, it's very simple um, for us, but we didn't explain it it uh, properly in the extract. Yes. So with with a magic with a first level uh, magic, you can you can. You can rust the uh, the uh, the weapon, but with with a uh, second level of magic, you can rust other other equipment. 
All right. I was I was curious if it was a case where a where depending on the school of magic, certain spells might be easier or more difficult. But I could see that kind of thing opening up some other problems. Um, nam namely, tr namely trying to balance everything crossways. What do you mean, bouncing cross waves? Um, more, more of um, if you were if you were to have if you were to have it where where um where a cer where certain spells were e where certain spells were easier in that regard, it you may there's the possibility of skew of skewing the of skewing the amount of build potentials for. Um, sp four different spellcasters, because I think I get the feeling one of the goals that you have when it comes to your magic system is to make it so that there isn't really a universalist style caster. Not necessarily, not necessarily, but but certainly a more universal than than we are used to in other uh, TTRPGs, Sword and Sorcery TTRPGs. At the same time, we... Yeah, if, if, if you mean universal... If, if you mean uh, by that the, the, the fact that there is more variety of, of spells, yes, but don't, but don't forget about... And all the schools will be mm -hmm. so. All the, all the spells and schools will be open for for all spellcaster casts, but uh, some will be more difficult. So, like with 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 the skills, primary, secondary, tertiary. So again, everything is open for you. But you, if you allocate your resources poorly, and and you know waste everything on on tertiary spells or tertiary skills, you you won't get too far. So, meanwhile, a universal spellcaster, as a as an abstract possibility, is of course open. And and if someone wants to have the most universal spellcaster, yeah, why not? But it will be quite weak, and and uh, you you should you are encouraged to optimize your your character better. But if for whatever Okay, we're back. All right. Mm -hmm. So where were we? Um, you had mentioned that a um, universal spellcaster will be significantly weaker. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. That's that's it. And uh, it's possible if if someone, for whatever reason, narrative or or um, curiosity, wants to create this universal um, character that 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 is moderately good in every school it's a possibility but but it won't be too too strong and too useful but it's there oh all right i can see that now i want to go into a bit on the um, on the set on the setting since that was the la that was the latter half of the yes of of the uh, document now the fir the first thing that i that i want to know when it when describing um atlas is the presence of ether um now of course ether ostensibly uh, the fi the fifth hellenistic element um would when it com when it comes to its when it comes to its presence, um, would e would um would e how how um I know it's mentioned it's know it's mentioned that it's that it's present in raw form in small quantities, but how common would it 
would that would that particular be that particular um, source be? Would it be a case where a small deposit of that would be en would be enough for countries to start wars over it? No, no, no. Uh, it's more widespread, but of course, it's it's quite rare. What how we imagine it that uh, it's it's in in crystallized form mm -hmm. and it can be mined but in like small scale very small scale um, so those mines would be pretty pretty valuable something to to start waging wars about even and it's quite frequent in in these etherides these floating islands which, which are quite characteristic of Atlas. But since those floating islands are relatively hard to approach, even in a magic-driven world like Atlas, mm -hmm. um, they are quite safe there. So over a, over a ring uh, made, of, made of ether, probably wars will not be started over, but but over over mines that you can you can gather the seed or certainly yeah. yeah. Now the this does this does tie into oh this does tie into um a a um a question regarding regarding magic items. Since there there's always a bit of a debate about how common or how or how um uncommon um magic magic items should magic items should be a lot in is it a case where um where sm where small scale magic items are more common but true but some but the more true artifice is extremely rare yes yes we we didn't want to to deviate from that Maybe, maybe even small scale magic items will be more unique. We, because we want to want to avoid this narrative where you can go into a magic shop and buy your stuff. Mm -hmm. We we want every magic item to be very special, very memorable for every character. Even though that magic is quite widespread. Uh, but still, there are some more uh, well-known magic craft item shops in certain more urbanized uh, territory of Atlas, where you can get magic items for money, very, in a very expensive way, of course. Uh, so even those smaller level magic items will be more rare than in other sword and sorcery TRPGs. And as in terms of artifacts, yes, we we will uh, craft some with very rich backstory and lore for for super high gear game. Um, they are they are coming when when we when we manage to finish our Kickstarter campaign uh, successfully. Um. And the next slide now, when it comes to the floating I when it comes to the floating islands or the skylands, you mentioned that them you mentioned them being um, difficult to access. Now, give, given the nature of spellcasting, I'd get I, I'd gather that that doing um, teleportation it would either would either be very high level or it or it'd be a case where you need to know exactly where you're going to make sure you don't teleport right in the middle of a tree or something and get crushed. Oh, hang on a sec, folks. Sorry, sorry about that. I, what I was going to what I was going to ask is. What are some what are some of the things that make um aside from the fact that they're in the sky, what are some of the things that make the Skylands um difficult to access even with the magic of Atlas? Alright, let me try let me try again. Yeah. 
Yes, so of course teleporting will be a very high level spell. Mm -hmm. so, so that's that. There are no, we, we don't plan a world where, where there are these, uh, you know, teleport gates in every major city and you pay a fair sum and you can travel to the end of the world within a blink of a knife for money. So it, uh, you, you have to get everywhere on foot or on, on horseback. Uh, also the lack of uh, winged mounts, uh, especially at low level. So those those are the main factors that, that the Skyland is still a very, let's say, romanticized, romanticized and unknown part of uh, Atlas. And so is the, let's say, Deep Lands. It's only a working title, uh, but you gather the idea. The, the underground system will be very um, stretched out and... Uh, as complex and as elaborated as the as the skylands and as the let's say normal surface so it's like a three level word the most playable more most optimized land part of atlas for players is of course the surface but but you can create characters from the skyland like like an Ayurkan character that is also contained in the extract or, or, or a character from the depths, but of course, um, to, to integrate into the societies uh, and cultures of the surface, it's, it's more difficult narratively, of course, uh, for, for those characters who come from the Skylands or the, or the Deathlands. All right. Now, the other, the other thing that I, want, that I wanted to touch a bit on is something that was mentioned at the end of the um, blurb on Atlas. The only law of magic is to serve balance. How particularly is that, is that enforced? Is that, is that something that's um, ironclad with, with a fish with, and drawing a line between um, people who follow that law and people who don't? No. Um... But yeah, but but it, it's quite. Um, let's say it's open to interpretation. What balance means and how serving balance is exactly accomplished. So there will be competing schools, competing or even a rival or even hostile hostile factions on what balance means and how to serve it. So it won't won't be a strict. We, we, it won't be a this 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 high high class wizard order government that hunts down the renegades, absolutely not. Uh, and also, we want to leave it to the imagination of uh, of the players who play a spellcasting class to to develop what he or she thinks balance is and play it throughout the game. Uh, all right. Now, next, I want to. I do want to touch on um, two coup. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna screw this up, and I apologize mm -hmm. in advance. To Kukshan. To Kukshan. To Kukshan. Uh, yes. Which, given a name like given a name like that, I couldn't. I. I think it would be fair to to assume that this that um a major influence with its motifs is the um. Is the re is south is a lot of areas in South America and especially around the Andes Mountains. One can say that. Mm -hmm. Um. Within within the within that particular, and that this does bring me to, um, one one curiosity that I ha that I have regarding th regarding this particular. Um, region. Now, I re when it comes to when it comes to the uh, classes. Now, and given the fact that we've mentioned things like fighters, bards, and sorceresses in the past, 
I'm curious if there are any cl if there are any classes or archetypes that are a little bit more specific to a given region. Yes, yes, we do. Uh, we have these, um, let's say, prestige classes. It's a working title in, in which, uh, by combining different uh, pre-requirements of class, race, uh, and uh, narrative background, you, you can choose this certain path. Uh, and we we most certainly want to make a prestige class out of out of something comes from to cook some, mm -hmm. but 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 creating these prestige classes it will will come after the the success, hopefully successful Kickstarter campaign uh, because because it's a big project also to to make them interesting but also make them balanced and also, you know, like very much intertwined into the world of Atlas. Mm -hmm. So that comes later, but we certainly, because Tukuksan is very, is, is one of the more, more, more wide regions of, of Atlas, um, very, very vivid and barbarian and, and jungle-like and, and everything. So mm -hmm. it leaves plenty of room to create uh, spicy prestige classes, but but not at this point just yet. Yeah. Now, when it comes, the other thing that the other thing that I did that I did note is the pillars when it comes to the description of the place, going into the location, um, the uh, ge the geographical uh, um, areas. As well as well as giving it given giving each a kind of almost gazetteer like approach was that the yeah, main thing that you was that the approach that you wanted to go with is the is akin to the old gazettes when it when it comes to describing the setting of Atlas if if it's called gazette style as you as you mentioned it yes. We want to we want to lay out every region from multiple perspective, geographically, socially, culturally, mm. and also in terms of what players slash adventurers could look for. So we go we go over the most uh, determining geographical units of, uh, in our case, Tukuksan, this jungle, the biggest river, the biggest swamp. Uh, the the coastline. Then we go through nations and organizations. What kind of factions do we have? Uh, what are the major political powers? Uh, what is their relationship uh, towards each other? What are the more um, obscure factions? What are the more more acceptable, politically acceptable, uh, or less evil ones? And then, then we go into the more detailed uh, politics, politics part of a region with, with cities, even mentioning certain uh, characters like this mad uh, pirate, pirate king who calls himself this pirate mage, even though he has nothing to do with magic. Uh, and then, or oh, what I have mentioned in in uh, in my first. Uh, stay with you in the monastery is that we want to make Atlas very vivid in terms of it's it's not gonna be only a collection of of dungeons and and dragon lairs but also very vivid and very very how to say it experienceable in terms of everyday life folklore mm -hmm. um, customs of ordinary people so we go into that too and yeah, so we made it with Tukuksan, this this uh, jungle region, but we will use the same methodology for uh, Valentis, which will be this uh, high uh, high fantasy medieval cathedral high castle princesses style of setting. We will have a desert region. We will have a very very monstrous uh, uninhabitable wasteland region. We will have a Nordic region for uh, which will resemble sort of like the the ancient Nordic lore, 
and we are also coming coming up with with other interesting places to create but but with this extract we wanted to wanted to show that yes we have ideas and we have uh, the methodology and uh, meticulousity of of creating a living world but we are not yet completed everything yeah now the last thing i, w I wanted to talk about was the was the um Race was the racial example given with the um, air can. Yes. Um, because because when I when I look at this, I'm looking at what I, what I feel like I feel like it can assume to be the template for how um, races are to are to be are um to be portrayed within the book. Um, exactly. Like go, going into going into the, going into their uh, particular life and and so on, but a couple of things that I wanted to t that I want to touch on specifically. Um, now, when it comes to now when it com now when it comes to um, skills and skills and abilities, I can I can infer that those are the inher those are the inherent traits of a given race. Yes, true that. Now, the second part of that is the background part of it, and to that end, what I'm curious about is how is um how is when it comes to back when it comes to backgrounds, is there a set amount of background points that a character would have at creation, and some of these can be ex can be spent on race specific things? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And uh, and obviously the more the more potent um, ones are going to be more expensive. You um, know the drill, man. Mm -hmm. Say again. You know the drill. Yeah. I've <laughs> I've been around. The, I've, I think I've been around the block one too many times. Um, <laughs> and of and of course. Of of course, the the whole myths, urban le urban legends, and and the like is one of those things where um I could I could see that being used by by a given GM to um to pr to have a bit of tension when somebody decides to say something stupid about it about a race that they're not familiar with because uh... um r because people. Because obviously people make, people make rumors and tall tales, especially especially when there's not there's not the best amount of communication between villages. Certainly true, mm -hmm. uh, partially, because we yes, these myths, urban legends about a more obscure race like this Ayurkan who live in the Skylands and and uh, use use these winged mounts and they are this hunter gatherer people of the sky. Of the skylands living in under prehistoric circumstances so there is not much knowledge about them so that always creates a a good atmosphere for guessing and and uh, urban legending if you allow me mm -hmm. but at the same time we wanted to give these um these um options for different parties depending on how vivid their imagination is. So let's say one urban legend about the Iron Can is that they they speak the tongues of birds and and they can command the birds instantly and uh, and tame them instantly. So let's say one one GM likes this concept and and can easily imagine uh, to 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 be played that this this animal, this bird tamer, Ayrkan character will be played by one of his or her players. So he introduces this urban legends, one urban legend about the Ayrkan as a truth. Meanwhile, in another GM thinks that okay, man, this is way too much. This is not true in our in quote to quote our atlas. So this is again an example that we want to to leave atlas as open-ended as possible uh, but giving strong cornerstones and uh, a narrative path to choose from 
All right, I can, I can definitely um, get behind that. Now, as a bit of as a bit of a capstone, I realize that these sort of things are going to be in flux. But do you have a window in mind as to when you're go as to when you're going to go live with the Kickstarter? We absolutely do. We go live on with Kickstarter on the thirteenth of October. Uh, probably noon, around noon East Coast time, but definitely 13th of October. Mm -hmm. So tell your nerd friends, tell your nerd children, your nerd parents about the great news because we are coming. Um, because as to give some background about it, Atlas Rise or Die started out as a long time about hobby project and we were curious how far we can take it. And without without boasting too much, I think we took it as far as we could with five guys doing it, all of us having a full-time job. Uh, one of us has two children. Mm -hmm. So at this point is um, we, we will either focus on it full-time as fulfilling one of our dreams, but that requires funding or unfortunately this this remains as it is as a nice memory our backers our lovely followers will decide but i think the uh, the tendencies are looking good we have managed to build up 10,000 facebook followers in four months so i think people like what we are doing especially the graphics which i'm not doing so um, I can understand that, but everyone, everyone is super enthusiastic, but at this point we need, we need more resources to continue, but, but we are quite optimistic about the future. And, um, again, our backers, our, our followers will decide whether Atlas die, rise or die is really worth of what it is and what it should come to be or or it's not. Rise or die in the end, huh? Mm -hmm. And I will I will definitely be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how that de how that um, develops as as the uh, weeks go as the weeks go in and we get clo and we get closer to its launch proper. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the myths of time zones to come to come up to the temple anytime mm -hmm. anytime it was my absolute pleasure Mildra. Mm -hmm. and of and of, and of course any and of course once the once the uh, kickstarter goes goes live and there and there's some more um, meat to chew on um i'd love to i'd love to have you back as always the 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 edict the edict applies drinking is not mandatory in the temple but it mm -hmm. is encouraged I can live with that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and of and of course, a sincere thanks to everybody who took the time out of their schedule to enjoy the madness. And there will be more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.